What if there were hot takes? And what if these hot takes were about the Hall of Fame? I was the first person to ask this question when I demand, I mean, asked you all to give me some monetizable content, I mean, Hall of Fame hot takes. So without further ado, computer, show me the takes. Omar Vizquel should be in the Hall of Fame. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna give you a more annoying voice for this take so you sound dumber. Omar Vizquel should be in the Hall of Fame. Accolades are greater than analytics. That's a little trick for all you amateur YouTubers out there. If you want someone to sound annoying, read what they've written in an annoying voice. Okay, so ignoring the unsavory off the field stuff that's happening with his candidacy, I mean, it is going splat. You know, putting too much stock into these accolades is kind of like plugging in a power strip into itself and expecting unlimited electricity. It's like this weird self-perpetuating cycle where the baseball writers are the people who give them these accolades in the first place, whether they're deserved or not, and then, you know, 10, 15 years later, those are the same people who do the Hall of Fame voting. So I think if you're someone who frequently criticizes things like the Gold Glove results, or the Cy Young results, or maybe the MVP results, maybe accolades shouldn't be prioritized over analytics, but, you know, if you're someone who, when those awards come out every year, you're like, hey, great job, baseball writers, then yeah, I get it. There is one Hall of Famer on the 2007 Red Sox, and it's Jonathan Papelbon. If I had to rate the hotness of your take on a 1 to 10 scale, I would probably give it a 13. You have to be a very specific type of person for this take to work, you know? You have to be someone who is willing to throw out Ramirez and Ortiz because of any PD connections, and Kurt Schilling because, you know, Kurt Schilling, and even Dustin Pedroia for lack of longevity, or John Lester despite 200 wins. I think Papelbon does have a Hall of Fame case if you're really open-minded about relievers in the Hall of Fame, probably revolves around his playoff success a lot, me personally, I shill for Joe Nathan on this ballot. I think Joe Nathan should be the strategic voting reliever, you know. The biggest issue would be if you were keeping Ortiz out based on, like, performance or, you know, the fact that he was a DH because I would not understand the mindset of someone who would let in a pitcher who threw 700 innings but not let in a great hitter who didn't play defense. What I'm saying is that reliever is the DH of pitching. That's the dumbest thing I've ever said on here. You can't let in Bonds without also letting in A-Rod. They are in the same tier as players, and if one gets in, so should the other. I get where you're coming from. You know, they're both inner circle all-time greats who cheated. You know, you could statistically make the argument that Bonds is the greatest outfielder of all time and A-Rod the best infielder. But I'm not sure if I agree, because Barry Bonds got caught up with Balco before league-wide testing, you know. It was still wrong to use PEDs, but it was effectively the Wild Wild West. You know, the league wasn't really enforcing against it. Whereas A-Rod was caught up with biogenesis well after the fact. You know, it was clearly a no-no. So, I think A-Rod's PED offenses are worse, but if you're sort of playing that character clause game... Bonds has those DV allegations, whereas A-Rod doesn't, so for many voters, I would imagine, it probably balances out in the end in a kind of a messed up way. I do think nuance is required rather than simply labeling certain players as steroid guys and that's the end of discussion. You know, David Ortiz is not in the same boat as Manny Ramirez for me. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen J. Nesbitt of The Athletic, voting for 10 means you have an undiscerning palate. Vote for eight or less and you know literally nothing about the sport. Nine is the right number. You know, people say nine is the thinking man's ten. You know, we've all heard this argument before countless times. I think the real answer is eleven. You should vote for eleven people. You know, I know the rules say to vote for ten, but sometimes you gotta get up on that ballot and just dominate, you know? I'm totally okay with the Hall of Fame being the Hall of Very Good to make more people happy. It's so arbitrary anyway, just let those that are close in. You're going for the basketball approach here, which I think is acceptable. You know, in baseball, we have the Hall of Fame. And in basketball, they have the Hall of Very Good. And in football, they have the Hall of Quarterbacks and Running Backs. 
I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. I just think that the football one is the worst. <laughs> the conventional wisdom of automatic induction to the Hall of Fame for, well, you know, numbers, should be revised downward to make for a more inclusive Hall of Fame, such as slightly lower numbers. You know this, but definitely important to keep in mind that it was never like, you have to win 300 games to be in the Hall of Fame. It was more like, once you got to 300 wins, there was just simply no more discussion. Like, you were in, you know? And so I can understand saying, hey, maybe 250 wins should be the new standard for pitchers because it seems like we'll never see a 300-game winner ever again. But it has to be better adjusted for each era of baseball because... 400 homers? Like, no way, dude. Not after the offense we've seen in the steroid and the juiced ball eras. I'm totally cool with letting CC Sabathia in because he has 250 wins. You know, if that was the arbitrary counting stat threshold he had to meet for the voters to actually like him, so be it. But are we letting in Edwin Encarnacion? Joey Votto to the Hall of Fame easy. He has 300 average, 400 on base, and 500 slugging. Yeah, if we're talking about automatic induction type numbers, I think 300, 400, 500 is a slightly more sabermetric approach that really hits the spot for me. There have been 20 players who reached 300, 400, 500 and at least 6,000 plate appearances, which is like 10 full seasons. And they're all in the Hall of Fame except for Todd Helton, who'll probably get in, and Manny Ramirez, who's going to be kept out for non-statistical reasons. And Joey Votto is in that club. Although with a 302 career batting average right now, it seems like there's a good chance he'll dip below 300 for his career when it's all said and done. You know, his new power-centric approach sort of caps his batting average upside. That said, the batting average component is probably the least important part of the old 345. You know, from my perspective, I've thought Joey Votto was a Hall of Famer for years. Like, that's pretty obvious to me, but it's not obvious to everyone, so it could be a hot take depending on who's watching. There's definitely some sick people out there who think he's just clogging up the base paths. The discourse around the BBWAA ballot has gotten exhausting, and I become much more interested in doing deep dives into the historical era committee ballots each year. Certainly not the hottest take. I mean, I think any healthy Hall of Fame discussion should start with the idea that, you know, the discourse well has run dry, especially considering, you know, with MLB and lockout, this is one of the biggest baseball things happening right now. I just wish the committee ballots were more frequent, especially with regards to black baseball. You know, Bud Fowler and Buck O'Neill will be inducted via the early baseball committee, but all those other guys like Vic Harris and John Donaldson and George Scales, they won't be back up for election for like a decade. It's crazy. Tommy Jean, why did I read that like he's French? Tommy John should have been in the Hall of Fame by now, if not in his regular 10 years on the ballot. I think it was actually 15. Discuss. I think that's decently hot. He only got like 32% of the vote in his final year on the ballot. And you know what? I totally agree. You know, if we're doing the purely counting stats thing right, 300 wins is typically considered automatic induction, and Tommy John had 288. I think just on pure merit, his numbers are better than Jim Cott, who just got in, and like Jim Cott, he's still alive, which I think should have incentivized the committee voters last time he was up for election. Tommy John is one of those candidates who sort of reveals the problems of categories, right? Like, he could go in as a player, but he could also go in as a pioneer. And maybe you don't feel like individually he would deserve it for those things, but if you could somehow combine them, then yeah, it's like he's an obvious Hall of Famer, right? Same thing sort of exists for Dusty Baker. Dusty Baker's like a Hall of Very Good Manager and a Hall of Very Good Player, but combined, he should just be like a Hall of Fame baseball person, Buck O'Neill, right? Another good example of this whole, you have to sort of shove them into this little box. I don't, you know, I don't like that. But yeah, no doubt, Tommy John and Dr. Frank Job completely changed the game. You know, you look at it, John Smoltz had Tommy John surgery. He's in the Hall of Fame. DeGrom had it before he even made the majors. He's probably going to be a Hall of Famer. Verlander's, you know, recovering from it. He's going to be a Hall of Famer. This is just an aside, but Dr. Frank Job once said that had he conceived the procedure a decade earlier it would have been called Sandy Koufax surgery. Gary Sheffield should get more credit for putting up the value he did despite his absolutely horrid defensive metrics. Were he to play for American League teams earlier in his career, we could be looking at a 70 to 80 reference war total, which would have put him in a lot more serious contention. 
I can push back on that a little bit because I did the math once, and if Gary Sheffield had played his entire career as a designated hitter, his war would have gone from 60.5 to like 63, so not really in that 70 to 80 range as a DH. Ultimately, you know, if your argument's going to be centered around war, you got to keep in mind War isn't keeping Gary Sheffield out of contention, right? I mean, this guy has 500 home runs and nearly 3,000 hits. It's Balco. I think it would make sense to compare Sheffield to someone like Rafael Palmero. You know, at least with the Bonds and Clemens candidacies, you get probably the best modern pitcher and hitter, statistically speaking. And so with Palmero and Sheffield, you get guys who statistically would definitely be Hall of Famers if not for the steroid stuff. So I think everyone acknowledges that Gary Sheffield had a Hall of Fame career. He just also, you know, got caught up with Balco. He's, he's stained. Whether you like it or not, that's the reality. I think the reality is Sheffield is not about performance. It's about PED. A Hall of Fame without a player so famous Lil Wayne named a song after him is no Hall of Fame at all. Scorching hot take, and you know why? Because it's a Kanye song. It's a Kanye song. It features Lil Wayne, but it's a Kanye song. And I must say, despite it being like 2007, like prime Lil Wayne, not the best verse from Wheezy on Barry Bonds. Not mm, not very good by his standards, I must say. Uh, here's a take for you. Graduation is super overrated. Like not even a top five Kanye album. And uh, 808s and Heartbreak and Yeezus are both better. David Cohn is an easy slam dunk Hall of Fame. I'm going to have to stop you right there, Ryan. Slam dunk is a basketball term. We're talking about baseball. Easy mistake to make. I'm going to keep reading. And his omission absolutely baffles me. He's as good as the likes of Juan Marichal and Tom Glavin. As a quick overview for a pitcher's career, I like to take a little glance at innings pitched and ERA+. Plus. You know, ERA+, plus is going to tell you how much better they were at preventing earned runs versus the league average on a rate basis, and innings pitched is just going to give you the volume. David Cohn, for his career, has 2,898 innings pitched and a 121 ERA+. Plus. And I did a little research, and it turns out most pitchers around that range actually aren't in the Hall of Fame, although it does include Dave Steeb, who I think totally deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, as well as Bob Lemon, who is in the Hall of Fame. So Cohn's case is really more of a toss-up for me, you know? I wouldn't call it a slam dunk. I wouldn't call it a power play. I wouldn't call it a corner kick. You know, Glavin has 1,500 more innings for his career, and Marichal has 600 more innings and a slightly better ERA+. Plus. Although, Cohn Cy Young might offset that a bit. Actually, uh, let's settle this once and for all. Does David Cohn follow me on Twitter? Uh, anyways, as I was saying, David Cohn is a great player, an even better man, and I hope anyone that didn't vote for him gets in a car accident. And I don't want them to be harmed. I don't want them to be physically harmed in any way in this car accident, but I do hope their car is totaled and that their insurance is real jerks about it. Playoff success is a completely valid way to justify a Hall of Fame candidacy, as long as there is also blah blah blah, blah blah blah, blah blah blah, Andy Pettit. I agree. There's precedent for it as well. You know, Bill Mazeroski and Jack Morris, I would say, are less accomplished in the regular season than Pettit, and yet also have that playoff pedigree. And yes, my approach is the same as yours. You know, I think good postseason performance, legendary postseason performance, that can absolutely be a boost to your candidacy. But what I wouldn't do is penalize someone for playing badly in the postseason or not playing in the postseason at all. It's more like that postseason performance is just going to push you over the edge if you need it. Of course, with Pettit in particular, it's about the steroids. You know, if he weren't a steroid guy, there's a good chance he would have been in by now. But I think with Burley also being on the ballot, having very comparable numbers in the regular season and being perceived as a clean player, yeah, priority's got to go to Mark Burley if that's the case. And like you said, you have to draw a line in the sand as far as that prerequisite, you know, regular season success, because otherwise, what are we going to do? Put David Freeze in the Hall of Fame? Cardinals fans, put down the computer. Put down your phone. Stop typing yes. I think someone like Paul Goldschmidt... Ah, oh, great. More Cardinals. I think someone like Paul Goldschmidt is on pace to have a very interesting Hall of Fame case, eerily similar to Scott Rowland, who should be in easily, by the way. Yeah, Goldschmidt just has to age 
not even good at this point, just like not bad. You know, he's put in the majority of the work needed for a Hall of Fame career. He just crossed over 50 reference war through his age 33 season, and most players who do that end up making it. In fact, almost all of them. But there is one comparable player who didn't, and that's John Olrood. And I think Goldschmidt is comparable to John Olrood through this point in their careers, so he just needs to finish his career better than John Olrood did. You know, John Olrood had a couple average seasons after that, basically, but I'd say Paul Goldschmidt probably has a 75% chance of getting in, given his current age and his current pace. There is somewhat of a precedent about snubbing those, you know, well-rounded, you know, good at defense first baseman like Don Mattingly or Keith Hernandez. I know some people are very passionate about those, but again, both those guys really didn't do much past their age 33 season. So Goldschmidt's just got to be not even really good from here on out. He just has to be like not bad. You know, just hang out, man, relax, put up some counting stats, put up like a 112 OPS plus over the next three years. You know, you don't have to move heaven and earth. You've done great. Hall of Fame plaques are lame. Hall of Fame jackets are dope. Absolutely 100% correct. I'm not quite sure if I could compare them 1-1 because, you know, you get to wear that jacket and keep it, I guess, whereas the plaques get stored in the museum. But yeah, the thing about the plaques is that if you were to actually visit the Hall of Fame, like the museum itself, the room with the plaques in it is probably the least interesting. Like, there's a lot of cool stuff in that museum, and then at some point, you're just gonna get to a room where there's a bunch of plaques looking at you. So, uh, plaques are kind of lame. You know, that's one thing I pointed out in the Tulowitzki and Linzicum video, right? Like, those guys and their fingerprints they left on the game are in the Hall of Fame. They're just not gonna be in the most boring room in the Hall of Fame. Ross Youngs is an overrated Hall of Famer. Well, that is just a terrible attempt at a hot take. You know, no one cares about Ross Youngs. Why would you say he's an overrated Hall of Famer? You're being weirdly redundant about this. You know, you saw that Ross Youngs is a Hall of Famer, and you went on your little website, Twitter.com, you come to me, and you say, he's overrated. That's not how it works. Ross Young's being in the Hall of Fame is the result of Frankie Frisch's cronyism on the Veterans Committee. Everyone knows that, but you know what? That was decades ago. No one on Twitter today is like, Ross Young's is a Hall of Famer who I rate very highly. No one says that. That doesn't happen. When was the last time you saw someone praise Ross Young's? Ross Young's is like, if there was a conspiracy to put Sean Green in the Hall of Fame, it's like, yeah, he'd get in, he'd give the speech, whatever, but just because the very small veterans committee is being silly doesn't mean someone is overrated. Anyone familiar with the Hall of Fame history just kind of rolls their eyes when they think about Frankie Frisch and his committee days and Ross Youngs and Chick Hafey and High Pockets Kelly and whatever. Sir, you do not know ball.